vices that some people blame for contributing to tech age angst also be used to detect it. And that has sparked uh, development of some apps that could warn of impending mental health crises. You might call it smartphone psychiatry or child security 2.0. I'll talk a little bit about it this morning. She is a neuropsychologist, Dr. Michelle Bengston, on the wake-up call. Doc, thanks for being with us. Good morning. What, what exactly is a neuropsychologist? <laughs> well, I'm a psychologist who specializes in understanding how the brain impacts our behavior. Okay, so... We've heard for a long time that, you know, uh, the electronic devices, Facebook, uh, you know, all this stuff that kids are connected to online uh, can cause depression. Apparently, I mean, I saw something yesterday or the day before about uh, supposedly Facebook uh, is really uh, prevalent in at least as part of a uh, symptomatic look at depression in females young females that that facebook is is bad not so much for males um is there any first off let's let's ask this question is it overstated or overblown that you know the constant social messaging and social media and the like causes kids to be depressed well yes and no Okay. There is evidence to suggest that, especially with our teen girls, that those who are spending more than about five hours a day, which is a lot, on social media tend to be more depressed than those who are spending an hour or less. But what that research doesn't take into account is that girls tend to identify with depression more than boys do anyway. So I'm not sure that it's the social media that is actually causing it, or rather a reflection of how our depressed girls are spending their time. Okay, so what, what I'm hearing you say is that they would have a tendency to be depressed anyway. Yes, yes. Right. You know, in women, women are, tend to be twice as likely to experience depression than males. Well, it, it doesn't just start in adulthood. It starts earlier in childhood and in the teen years. And I'm curious, why is it that it's more prevalent in females than males? Is, is it the fact that males just aren't as empathetic? Well, I'm glad you asked that because we arrive at those statistics based on those who seek out help. So I'm not even convinced that girls or females really are twice as depressed or twice as likely to be depressed as males. As much as they are, they're the ones who are more likely to seek help, and that's where we get our statistics from. And girls, females, they will identify with the label depressed, whereas boys and men, they're less likely to identify with the label of depression, but they will readily admit to their irritable or agitated. Okay, fair enough. Um, so then that leads to the other question then, uh, which would be, you know, is there anything to how these, you know, apps are being developed that supposedly would go, oh, oh, warning, you, you could have a depressed kid here based on whatever. Well, you know, the apps are just in the developmental stage, and they're looking at things like changes in typing speed and voice tone and word choice to try to assess whether or not these are signals. But the question is, are those really signals or is that just noise? But my greater concern is, what are they going to do with this information? Facebook, for example, they analyze with their algorithms every single post to assess and see who might be at risk for suicide. But they're not trained in mental health. They don't have any training truly in crisis management. So there were, there's a huge risk that our sensitive personal mental health and health information is going to be dispensed inappropriately. So what, it, what okay, let's... Let's go back. Uh, you said they're already, you know, uh, using whatever metric they're using to, you know, try and determine if somebody is suicidal or not. Um, when they get that information and some sort of uh, beeping digital red flag goes off, what, what do they do with that information? Well, 
Do you, do you get a nice well, note from Facebook that, that Facebook that says, we're really worried about your mental condition. We hope that you go get some help. Or is it something yeah. you know, they call authorities? What do they do? When Facebook, according to their algorithm, determines that somebody may be at risk for suicide, they will then contact the authorities. And the authorities then go seek out the people who posted those posts. And so we run a huge risk then that authorities are going to be called into a situation that really isn't that alarming. And then that may even turn that person less likely to seek help in the future because they've been so stigmatized. So, doctor, let's put the app aside and the social media. Uh, if we have symptoms in front of us, if we're seeing somebody, maybe a child or a coworker, and their typing is starting to uh, um, slow. Diminish. And, yeah, and you see some uh, some symptoms of possible depression. What are three things? Where should you go? What should you do? First of all, I would talk to the person. Let's have an open dialogue. Let's talk and say, how are you doing? Here's what I've noticed, and I'm concerned. And if there is reason for concern, first of all, seek out your medical professional. Let's go to your regular doctor because there are a lot of medical conditions that can bring on signs and symptoms that mimic depression. And we don't want to treat a mental health disorder if it's really because you've got low vitamin D or because you've got a thyroid deficiency. Good point. So let's assess that first. And if there truly is a case of it's depression or anxiety, then contact your local mental health professional and let them assess and let them figure out the most appropriate way to treat. But let's not leave that in the hands of Facebook and Snapchat. Well, you bring up a really good point. What do they do with that particular information? Uh, particularly if you're talking about something as uh, gray as depression, you know, based on how fast you're typing. Um, who would they, if if... You know, they create this metric that says, oh, you're depressed. What, what are they going to do with that? Are they going to call the school, call your parents? I mean, wh who, what do they do with that information? Once a post is flagged for potential risk, then it's sent on to a team of content moderators. And we don't know what specific training those moderators have around suicide risk or depression. But what we do know is that these moderators tend to be contract employees with a high turnover and little training on how to cope with disturbing content. Right. So just another way that Big Brother is, is watching you and uh, essentially profiling you. It, it really is. And in the United States, you know, basically, by signing up for these social media apps, you're opting in to having all your posts and comments and videos scanned for possible risk. But what's really interesting is that this sensitive information, they, the data protection laws don't apply. So for a mental health professional, you know, we're under HIPAA. Mm -hmm. That is not the case for these social media platforms. And in Europe, they won't allow such a thing. They really take privacy seriously. All right. Dr. Bingston, thanks for joining us on the wake-up call this morning. It's my pleasure. All right. You take care.